Chapter 3 Night City Stories V woke up to the familiar sound of the TV playing in the background. She had left it on. Nothing about that was unusual. What was odd was the green message that invaded her ocular cyberware. It sprang to her vision like an unwanted pop up box. It was her system telling her that something was wrong. But she didn't really need it. She could feel the sickness spreading through her body as she got on her feet. She was walking towards the door when her phone chimed. It was Jackie. She answered. He said, Whoa, V. You get your beauty sleep? <laughs> no matter. Time you got up. Instead of continuing to the door, she went to the window and opened the blinds. A flood of bright sunlight spilled into the apartment. But then, in her moaning voice, she answered, I think I might have caught something when I jacked into that corpo's biomon. I know a neurovirus or... I need to see Vic. Let him tell me what's got my head reeling and my stomach churning. Okay, let me take you. I brought you a ride. Yeah, throw on some threads, meet me downstairs. Said Jackie with sympathy. When the call had ended, she left the apartment. She didn't go far before she received another call. This time, it was from a caller named Regina Jones. V had never heard of the name before, but she answered. A thin-faced, dark-haired woman popped up in V's vision. She wore a dark patch over her right eye to cover some ancient injury. The patch was the same shade of black as the hair she pulled into a long ponytail. From under the patch, faint scar lines tapered out like spider legs and crawled some ways onto her damaged skin. Her sole brown eye, sharp and unyielding, focused on V. The woman went right to business and said, Hey V, Regina Jones here. If you're looking for work in Watson, give me a call. V was surprised that she knew her and replied, How did you find me? How'd you even know my name? I know where to gather my intel. Could even call me a collector. Later, V. After the call had ended, V walked to the gate that was right in front of her place. Just last night, she remembered it being inoperable. She was glad it had been fixed overnight. She didn't want to have to walk all the way around in a condition. When she got to the stairs, she heard two police officers call out in front of one of her neighbor's doors. NCPD! Open up! V didn't wait to hear the rest. As interesting as that situation was, her priority was to get to the Ripper Dock. It wasn't something she was eager for, really. But it was necessary, like visiting the doctor's office. Ripper Docs were technically medical professionals. They married the human body with implants for both practical and superficial reasons, treading the thin line between your average primary care doctor and a tattoo artist. They went down the stairs, passing strangers who were probably neighbors that she had never met. Her apartment building, like most buildings in Night City, was large and crammed full of people on every floor. Although she was typically an introvert, whether by choice or because of her recent relocation to Night City, it wasn't surprising that she didn't know her neighbors. It was Night City after all, and people filled every nook and cranny like pests. V continued on the floor below and went past a man pounding on a vending machine. He probably won't get his money back, she thought. Then she cut through a section in the building where vendors sold food and other things that machines can't sell. Right after the vendors was a sort of open outdoor gym. As she crossed it, she heard a friendly voice call out to her to ask. Hey, yo, me. How about a round or two? What do you say? The voice belonged to a tall, dark, and muscular man she knew as Coach Fred. Along with his usual bald head and fighting gloves, oh, like he was wearing a back. red tank top over shorts and matching shoes. He stood right hit. behind a humanoid Curious robot. The, the thing was outfitted with boxing gloves so and full body patterns. Sometimes she would chat with Fred on her way through the building. They mostly talked about fights. But today was not one of those times. And as much as she wanted to test her skills on Fred's new training bot, 
her malfunctioning systems told her otherwise. I'll catch up to Fred later, she noted mentally, but she should have said it out loud. Fred was a tough, retired boxer and she wasn't worried about hurting his feelings. She kept on her way towards the elevators. As she was passing a store bearing a large orange neon sign that read Second Amendment, she heard a voice called out to her. It said, It took her a moment to notice a shopkeeper talking to her behind the wired metal gates. She knew him too. And again, right now was not the time. She continued into the elevator and selected the lower floor. The always-on TV panels in the elevator blared unwanted news at her. When the elevator settled down, she was glad to exit it, just to get away from all that noise. But there was no peace outside of the elevator, as the lower floor was busy with more shops and talking people going about their business. Two police officers on a counter were having an un uncomfortable conversation. V overheard. She went down the large, short stairway that led out of the building, passing an NCPD officer taking statements from two men. Immediately after, she saw Jackie, seated and eating at a little shop that had hanging orange lamps marked with Chinese symbols. Behind the counter was a cook throwing down. The smell of his food filled a large radius with the enticing aroma of fresh cooked meals. Real food, not the vending machine stuff. Woman of the hour. <laughs> it took you long enough. The an appetite just wait. Jackie called out to V. Sit down, let me finish this. Then we can drop in on Senor Vector. V took one of the two worn-out vacant stools next to Jackie, still not feeling quite up to a conversation. She said with a strained voice, I mentioned something about a surprise yesterday. Am I remembering right or just had a brain fart? Jackie shook his head, shoved some food in his mouth using chopsticks and replied, Probably both, because you usually forget shit. But it just so happens... I think I might have bagged us a sweet ass J-O-B. An error message popped up on V's vision. She ignored it and looked towards the street where a large billboard was advertising a movie called Passion. She replied with skepticism. Go on. Jackie continued. I mean, maybe it's not as big as that, but just that it's fronted by a little known someone named Dexter Deshaun. And with more excitement, he added. Only the top fixer in night fucking city. Fat-ass black Jesus of the afterlife. 300 pounds of partly gold-plated coup. V, surprise, ask. How did you manage to pull this? Trade in your spleen or something? Far as I know, we're not the type to get fingered by Dex. You me? Oh, but T-Buck, she's the one that hooked us up. Got us talking. Knew it was a done deal the moment he laid eyes on me. Just come on. Ain't nobody who can resist this. Am I right? <laughs> sure, Jack. Whatever you say. She replied with a chuckle. Then she asked, So what's the gig? We meant to come out in one piece? As Jackie replied, she looked at some dumplings and soup under the glass countertop in front of them. She couldn't tell if they were props or real food that the chef had set out as advertisements. Either way, they looked good. Good enough to eat. And if she wasn't feeling nauseous, she'd probably join Jackie. Well, our savior wants to tell you everything himself, face to face. No pressure, but old deal's riding on you now, chica. She asked after, a little annoyed. Why do I got it? Human T-Bug draw straws without me? Jackie explained. T-Bug and Dex go way back, and my face is yesterday's news. All Dex says he needs to check you, talk to you. Look, V, it's his job, his rules. I can't blame him for taking a personal approach. And it ain't as bad as you think, okay? Trust me. Yes, I got no choice then. Replied V, truthfully. Jackie went on. Dex is a real deal when it comes to fixers. Don't get me wrong. Man. Don't got nothing against the Padre or Wakako, but Dex is in a league of his own. Man.
Not really, no. It's always the same story. You land on fresh turf, local fixer waves his dick around, but he's smiling, saying you'll be up to your neck in gigs and eddies. Still, all you are is another name in their little black book. Nifty tool for getting them a fat slice of whatever half-baked shit pie they're climbing on the table. Sure, you crack jokes over drinks, but in the end, it's biz. Then he said something in Spanish as he put the box of food down. He set down V's car key on the counter. Brought your wheels. Gave them to my guy yesterday to smooth over the dents after our uh, dust up with the scabs. V took it and said, Thanks, Jack. Much appreciated. She summoned the car, and in moments, the car came and parked autonomously nearby, waiting for her. Jackie said, Top notch work Miguel did. Rides like it looks. Factory new. We'll see about that. So we rolling or what? Let's feel this factory new ride. V replied as they left the little shop. They walked towards the car as a feminine voice announced something in a foreign language over loudspeakers. The place sounded like an airport. They found the car waiting right in front of a pedestrian crossing lane marked by construction orange stripes with big letter X's and the word WAIT displayed prominently. V crossed over to the driver's side. A sweet sounding voice sang a cappella somewhere in the streets nearby. The voice died out completely when V shut the door and Jackie asked. Then he added, Easy on the gas, eh? I just ate. I was supposed to stop by Vic's anyhow. I got a date. Me and Miss D. You don't say. Replied V with some She's interest so before Jackie continued. Really gets me, you know? The rest of the short drive was spent without words. And the only sounds were from the upbeat instrumental music on the car's radio and the muffled sound of the streets of Night City. After V parked and they climbed out of the car, Jackie said, yeah, this is it. Come on, V. He added, Find me once Vic's done dusting your circuits. We'll hash out what Dex has cooked up for us. They pushed their way through a throng of pedestrians and went past a storefront labeled Jack Watch and yourself. Cook in bright neon blue and pink. Right across the store, a man with a taped up backpack emptied his bladder on a dumpster. Down the alley, before Mrs. Esoterica New Age store, and right across a pink lit strip club called the Gomorrah, a homeless man wearing dark, tawdry clothing preached something that sounded like nonsense to V. V filed into Mrs. Store after Jackie. She was greeted with the warm smell of burning candles over the comfort and fragrance of healthy, growing bonsai plants. A large statue of a man with four arms, two held up identical balls of purple lights, while the other two rested just under its belly. The statue sat on the counter in front of a hanging pattern red cloth. With a calming stare, the statue beckoned visitors deeper into the store, where various trinkets like decorative scrolls, Asian statues and ceramics lived on various shelves. Deeper in were reclining chairs that helped make the place look homely. The shop gave off a relaxing vibe, just like Mrs. Voice, the owner. Hey, v. Misty was a short, round-faced woman with green eyes under smoky eye shadows. Her haircut, style with an upside-down bowl, was trimmed a little at the front. A dark blouse with an overflowing collar exposed her shoulders and were in great contrast with the spike choker that wrapped around her neck besides two dangling black necklaces. Black stained lips stood out below her long nose and above her dimpled chin. Dr. Vector will see you now. She said sweetly to V. And Jackie leaning over the small counter between them added, I'll sit tight over here. Me and Misty got a little kitchen up to do. V went past, past the counter, past the statue in the back of the store, through a back room that looked like a supply closet, and out a door that led out to a trash littered alley. Straight from the back of Misty's place were two short stairways. One led up to maybe a hotel, and the other led to an underground basement. And being in Japan town, both places are signs with Asian symbols. A woman, a child and a cat sat at the foot of the upstairs. 
The woman was drinking a canned beverage while the child played with what V hoped was a toy gun. The cat sat in front of a ceramic bowl full of something that didn't look half as bad as V had expected. V stopped and ran a gentle hand over the gray alley cat. The cat meowed approvingly and V continued down the stairs that were bathed with the green light of a neon sign. As expected, V found Ripper Dog Victor in his studio behind a wired and collapsible security gate. V opened and said, Vicky's bright as ever, you old Ripper. Good to see you. She entered the large room. Deeper in the back of the room was a storage area where Vic probably kept cyber parts. From the darkness on the left side of the room, an operating chair with some medical equipment glowed under the cool professional lights. While on the right, a couple of desks, random tools, a row of trophies, a screen, and a few oddly placed signs set under a line of neon red lights that ran horizontally a third of the way up the wall. There too, tinkered Victor on a prosthetic device that he wore on his left hand for operations. A screen showing an underground boxing match displayed in front of him. Although V called him old, Vic looked like a middle-aged man. He was a retired boxer, and the small scars and damaged tissues on his face corroborated that fact. Nothing on him looked old. The only part of him that could probably show his age with some accuracy were his eyes, and those were forever hidden behind large, dark sunglasses. A thick shock of black hair matched the sunglasses that were fixed on his large, scarred nose. Strong laugh lines and a permanent eyebrow crease line his face. Unusual for a ripper duck, or anyone living in Night City, Vic had no visible cyberware installed on himself. His clothing, a blood-stained, rolled-up, short-sleeved shirt tucked into dark cargo pants, were casual. A stethoscope hung casually around his neck and under the lapels of his shirt like a loose tie. Inside the opening of his shirt was a jewelry reminder of the old days of boxing. An electronic device, no bigger than a cassette tape, was tucked into the rolled up left side of his sleeve, accentuating the large bicep from his former life. Victor paused the streaming match and the screen shut off momentarily, and said to V, Good to see you too, V. It's been a while. To what do I owe the pleasure today? Vlee replied somberly. Last gig, had to jack into a client's neuro socket. Think I might have gotten spiked. And the reminding system malfunction message popped up on her vision. Vic listed a few symptoms. Experiencing migraines, nausea, hypersensitivity to bright lights. Oh, kitten caboodle. Agreed V. Vic straightened up and rolled his chair away from the desk to face V and said, All right, kid. We'll sort you out in a flash. Besides that, how are things? V was excited about her new promotion into the underworld of Night City. She wanted to bring up her new fixer Dexter Deshaun right away, but held her tongue and said instead, Need some new kit, but tools, not toys, Vic. Time I bumped up my sights and got a grip. When Victor laughed and asked, <laughs> Really? Now? Finally? She took the opportunity to announce her exciting news. She said, Vic, shit's getting real. Got a job from Dex to Sean. Hitting the major league. In a set of smooth and ingrained motions, Victor stood, threw the screwdriver he was using over to the desk, and kicked his rolling stool across the room to the operating chair, and replied, The Dexter Deshaun? <laughs> well, that is something. But let me guess. V replied with humor. Quit crying, Vic. I'll bring you the Eddies later, with interest. You know I will. At this point, she had owed him 21,000 eddies. Cyber implantations, although ubiquitous in Night City, weren't cheap. Victor said flatly, hmm. Last When he found what he was looking for, an ejection to steady his operating hand, he slammed it down on his forearm, adding another mark to the ones that dotted his forearm like polka dots. His left arm fingers danced under the apparatus with a clicking sound. He gestured at the operating chair and said, Chair, please. Sit down and relax. V set herself down on a blue faded chair with her feet dangling a few inches off the edge. Victor plopped down on his stool, reached down out of sight and fished out a dark canister labeled Kiroshi. 
He opened it and pulled out an eyeball. Then he held it up admiringly, and before setting it down in a machine, he announced, Kuroshi Optics, best I've got, and should be about right under the circumstances. He brought a cable to V and said, Now jack in. V thought about commenting on the value of the Kiroshi optic. She knew she didn't have the eddies for that right now. She said nothing and simply jacked in. Victor pulled down a screen while explaining. You peruse and choose while I scan. See what's going on inside. Through her cyber system, V accepted the new implants. The Kiroshi optics and a ballistic co-processor for her right palm. While she looked at a couple of screens displaying health information in front of her, she heard Victor say, Mark 1, like I said, decent enough scanner. Displays data on your cornea. Cherry on the tops of built-in external lens disruptor. His fingers moved across the screen with effortless precision as he continued to explain. In layman's terms, any surveillance cam will capture your face as a blur. And just remember, your body will still show up as crystal clear. Hmm, this should do the trick. Talks to Kuroshi Tech too. V consent to the operations by saying, I'm ready, carve away. Victor rolled his tool to the other side of the operating chair and with a tinge of excitement and a smile on his face, he said, Excellent, let's do this. He sent an extension of the chair with a round opening upright and told V, major league arm of yours right here. He replied. Just like that. Thanks. Then he brought up a medical gun with anesthetic and shot V's arm. He said. Now a bit of anesthetic and I can start cutting. A pattern of four red dots marked her arm. Victor returned to his stool and asked. Feel anything? V replied with humor. Play by play though? <laughs> really doc? Makes you sound like a dentist, always going on and on. Victor came back around and, adding to the humor, said jokingly, Don't be mean now. Remember, I'm old. I got a shaky gannic hand. Could slip. With his right hand, he adjusted V's face, and as he plunged the apparatus down her eyes, he told her, Lights out for a minute, all right? For a moment, V wandered in a pitch black, void, and limitless field of vision. She remained calm and listened to the clicking and whirring of electronic devices. The most constant sound was a steady beeping. It was her anchor and gave her a faint hope that couldn't be explained. Although it was only seconds, it felt like forever before Vic announced. Okay, let's test this. See the magic in action. Linking you in. Then suddenly, she could see herself. Not unlike a dream where she could step out of herself and take an objective look. From that angle where the eyes sat, she watched Vic come in to grab her eyes, and behind him, her awkward body laid stiff with uncomfortableness. Her breasts rose up and down steadily, and the cold light bounced off her lips and skin just as objectively as she was watching herself. It was a strange affair. As Vic oriented the eye and brought it to her face, he explained. You might feel a little discomfort at first. Blurred vision, low contrast, glitches. After the install, Vic popped back down on the stool and asked. Well, how's it look? Feel alright to you? V looked around, felt grateful to be back in her head again, but also felt a sense of discomfort from the out-of-the-body experience. Her new vision bounced from one thing to the next, relishing the newfound clarity. There was no error in her optics, and she focused on a crisp view of Vic and said with joy. Oh, this is fantastic. Vic swung to the other side of the chair again and told her. Oh, beautiful. Time for the scanner. Took V a brief moment to get the feel of scanning with her new eyes. She set her scanner on Vic and a small overlay window displayed some basic facts of what V knew of him. His full name, Victor Vector, for example. Victor went on explaining in the extensive archive of NCPD uploaded to this system. Victor said, It might take you a few seconds to adjust, but first time's rarely the charm, with anything really. 
The scanner should eventually sync with your thought processes and read your intentions. I also inject an NCPD file search. Run into any ne'er-do-wells? <laughs> you know exactly what they ne'er-did well. All the while, the machine attached to the chair had been busily moving, rotating, carving, and adding to V's palm. When the machine had finished its work, V pulled out and examined her hand augmentation. Her palm felt stiffer than usual under the new metallic palmer surface that started at the last phalanx of each finger all the way down to the base of her palm. It was mostly of a granite color with a couple of red tension cords running about a third of the length of the entire cyberware. Victor laughed as he replaced the machine out of sight. Then he said, <laughs> It ought to work like a charm. Now draw your weapon. You should see your ammo count in a brand new sight. V pulled out her weapon and aimed down. And there on the far right corner of her vision, just as Victor had said, she saw her ammo count. She was about to say thanks when she remembered the virus that messed up her systems and forced this trip to the Ripper Dock. She asked, How about the neurovirus from the last job? Can you check it? Victor explained, Done and gone while we were putting in your implant. And a full sweep on your soft and circuits. Zap the critter. You're certified bug free. Impressed and elated, V said, Shit, Victor, not bad. I don't know what to say. Victor sat down an orange glowing medical pump and instructed her. Say you'll take this and remember the dosage. Two whiffs now and another two in an hour. She took the air pump, set it in her lips and pumped the meds into her lungs. Then she said while getting down to her feet. You're the best, Vic. I owe you. Vic slid his tool back to where V had found him when she first came in. He tapped his boxing match back on and told V. Go on, kid. Show them what you're made of. And once you hit the big leagues, don't forget where you came from. On the way out, she received a message from Jackie. A snapshot of it showed that he was getting impatient. She didn't read it, nor was she bothered by it. She was equipped with new cyberware. Her mind was clear, her vision was sharp. She felt like a brand new woman, ready for Night City. <laughs>